some aprons, some clothes, and what did he make it from? Skin. Animal skin. So in order to have animal skin, what have you got to do? You've got to shed the blood. So God set the precedence. God said in order for sin to be covered, there's got to be blood to be shed. By carrying out this act of making clothes for Adam and Eve, he shed the blood. And then it says that he sent them forth out of the garden. Because he said if we don't, and they are able to stay in this garden and eat of what kind of tree that they'll live forever. The tree of life, if they stay in the garden, eat of the tree of life, then they'll never die. It'll just go on and on and on. Now there's another place in the Bible that talks about the tree of life besides here in Genesis. And where is that? In Revelation, it has to do with what? Three things. And all of them begin with new. New heaven. new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. And in the midst of them, it says that there will be the tree of life. So we'll have access to the tree of life that Adam and Eve had access to. Now that would be a great thing. You didn't know you were going to get to go back in Genesis after the church age has come to an end and going to be able to eat at the tree of life. So God sent them forth after he had killed an animal, after he shed the blood, after he had clothed them, he sent them forth. And he said, i got to keep them from getting back into the Garden of Eden. So what did he do? He set up a flaming sword. And what did that sword do? Just the tree of life. Yeah, but how did it? It just, yeah, you got it. Baby. It just swung every which way. And it was a flaming sword. So that's compared to the Word of God. The Word of God said that the Word is a sword, it's two edged. But this was a flaming sword, and He sent them forth out of the Garden of Eden. Now, we pick up in the fourth chapter. And I want you to pay close attention to the words. And Adam knew Eve his wife. Now that does not mean he walked up to her and said, I'm Adam and you're Eve. How do you do? <laughs> Ernest T. Bass. <laughs> Y'all, some of you don't know what I'm talking about. But that's Andy Drew. <laughs> When you run across the word new in the Old Testament, it means to have sexual relations. <coughs> to have sex. So Adam had relation with his wife Eve, and then it says, by doing that, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord, and she uh, again bare him up, bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Got two brothers. Now I want you to realize, now this is not written in the Bible, but you've got to think for just a minute. Third verse, in the process of time, it came to pass that <coughs> Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord and Abel. He also brought of the first length of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance failed. Now, it does not say this, but it has to be. Cain and Abel one day just didn't decide, hey, we're going to offer up an offering to the Lord. It just didn't happen that way. Who saw, who saw God shed blood and make clothes. Adam and Eve, that he of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Their eyes were open. They saw God do this. So they had carried out this same ritual that God had set up that we'll see follow all the way through the Old Testament. So every year, Adam and Eve was taking and making a sin offering of atonement to God. 
at Cain and Abel as little boys. Now, it doesn't say this, but it had to be Cain and Abel as little boys every year. They saw Adam and Eve take and make a sacrifice and shed blood. If they had not have seen this, how would they have known to offer up a sacrifice for themselves? They wouldn't have. Now, two brothers from the same parents, not stepbrothers, full brothers, it says that Cain was a what? He was a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer. And that Abel was what? Man, he took care of livestock. So when it came time to offer up the offerings, Abel, Abel took the first leaves of his flock. Now what does that mean? It simply means, in relation to us, that God should get the first of our fruits. The very first. When you have a tomato crop, Go pull the first of your tomatoes off. That's your first ones. I remember, Mary Lou remembered this, that after Daddy got killed, we had uh, a fellow to come in and took the bottom land and planted corn there, and it was supposed to have been on the third. We got a third. He got two-thirds of it. And when it comes time to gather it, you know what he did? He took all the nubbins and gave that to Mother. And he took the best corn. That's the first one. First fruits. So Abel, Abel, he brought the very best that he had of the animals, the first of it. And he offered a sacrifice. He shed the blood, offered a sacrifice unto God. Cain, his brother, a tiller of the ground, it says that when he came, he did not bring the firstlings of his crops. He went out there and picked up the nubbins. Whatever's left over. Well, what's that got to apply to us? Your money. And I have to say that y'all have learning and that you have learned. You're learning to tithe. You're learning to give. That's a good thing. That's what we're supposed to do. Uh, I should never have to say we need that already ought to be met before it ever gets done. So it says that Cain brought a vegetable offering. Then it says that God rejected Cain's offering. Why? Because the only way sin can be atoned for is blood. Vegetables, works, whatever, it will not get an atonement for sin. Sin continues on. Now, I want you to pay close attention in the sixth verse. Now, Abel offered up a blood sacrifice, Cain a vegetable. This is what God said. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thou countenance fallen? Now, he was, it hurt his feelings because God rejected him. This is what God did. And if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Now God is giving him a second chance. You won't find second chances in the Bible very often. But he's giving him a second chance. He's saying, I will not accept vegetables for a sin atonement. What you need to do is take up some of your crops and go over to your brother Abel and do some trading with him. You swap him some of your rochnirs and some of your carrots, gather up all these things and y'all make a trade and get a lamb from him or a goat and bring it back over here and offer up a sacrifice. Gave him a second chance. He wouldn't do it. That tells me, tells you, that you cannot get to heaven and you cannot have forgiveness of your sin but one way, that is by accepting Christ as your personal Savior. No other way. Amen. You say, well, I'm a Baptist. Baptists can go to hell just like an alcoholic. 
Doesn't mean anything because you're a Baptist. You can join every church, be dunked in every mud hole till ever minna knows your name, rank, and serial number from here to Japan. Still die and go to hell. Don't mean anything. Amen. Blood bought way. So Cain was rejected. Abel was accepted. The second thing that happens is you're going to record the first murder in the Bible. Isn't it amazing that God offered forgiveness of sin? One accepted, one rejected, but the one that rejected got mad to kill the one that was accepted. Does that make any sense? Yeah. <laughs> Acceptance. Rejection. So, 8th verse down through the 15th verses talks about the first murder. Cain was, I mean, eat up with anger at his brother. So he caught him out in the field and he killed him. After his death, God asked him, said, where's your brother? What did he say? Am I my brother's keeper? God said his blood crieth out from the earth. So he told him, he said, because you've done this, I'm going to make you as a vagabond. I'm going to send you out like a hobo. You're going to roam all the days of your life. Now, I want you to look in the 15th verse. I was taught this, heard this from little all the way up. Have you ever heard that Cain received a mark and that's where the black people came from? <clears throat> you ever hear that? All right. That's a lie. That is a lie. Black people didn't come from Cain. That's not the mark that he put on it. 15th verse, And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should be killed. Now, this mark was for Cain's protection. This is part of the price that he had to pay because of his unwillingness to give God a blood sacrifice. This is not where the black man came from. The mark that was put on him was not of the black man. Genesis 9 6, you don't have to turn there, but there was no law at this time saying thou shalt not kill. Nothing in the Bible. See, they had just come out of the Garden of Eden. Civilization had just started there were no rules, regulations. God had given and let them be to themselves, their conscience. Have you heard people say, man, that guy doesn't have a conscience at all. That person has a good conscience. You can't trust your conscience. Because our conscience is filthy. Our conscience is dirty. He said, I don't believe that. Well, you will in a minute. So he set a mark on him. What was that mark? I don't know. It might have been X's and O's. Don't know what that mark was. But the mark was that nobody could kill him. If they killed him, it would return to them sevenfold. So he sent him out. And from that 16 down through the 24th verse, it talks about the 16th verse, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife. And you remember what we said? Didn't go up and say, I'm Mr. Cain, and you're Mrs. Cain. How do you do? That wasn't it. They had sexual relations, and she conceived. You say, well, all right. Where did he get his wife? It said he went into the land of Nod and knew his wife. Where'd he get her? He took her with him. Do you think that Cain and Abel were the only children that Adam and Eve had? Adam and Eve were the only two living people on the face of this earth. And so they had children after children after children. Where did Cain get his wife? His sister. 
Word Abel, his sister. This whole thing started from two people and brothers and sisters. You say, man, that's immoral. Maybe it's immoral now, but it wasn't immoral then because that's where it all got started. We're kin folks. <laughs> I kept telling everybody, man, they put a wall around Valley County and didn't let anybody in. <laughs> We're all kin. Now you know we are all kin. Everybody in the world. Because we started and came from Adam and Eve. If you want to trace your genealogy, there's some people that I like to do that too. But they have on my grandmother's side seen where she came from. But I can go further back than that because I can go to the Garden of Eden and we're all kin and we all came from the same place. And so Cain knew his wife. She conceived. Uh, and, she, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. So we're seeing the first civilization, the first city being built. And it comes from Cain, not from Abel. Now you remember the firstborn is always the heir, the heir to the throne. So civilization didn't start from the righteousness of God. It started from one that was unrighteous, that was drove out because he had committed a murder because he would not give God a blood sacrifice. So he was sent out. And then in the 25th verse, it says that God's going to do something special. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said she hath appointed the another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew. So now we're going to see the righteousness of God. In Abel it was killed when Cain slew him. So Adam and Eve had another son and his name was Seth. This is going to be the godly line, the righteous line. Now women understand, I don't mean to be offensive to you. But in the Bible, women very seldom ever mention. Why? Uh, this, the bloodline comes from the man. How many of you women lost your identity when you got married? <coughs> Barbara did. <laughs> she was a timer. Now she is a crow. She has been a crow longer than she was ever a time. Yep. <laughs> and so you, when you look at her, you say, there goes Barbara Crow. Her middle name is Ena. Isn't that a cool name? But she's been Ena 70 years. She's been a crow 40, soon be 49. So... Women, all through the Bible, you'll very seldom ever see women's names when it talks about birth. Because the birth, the bloodline comes from the man. That don't mean you're not important. You are important. Because I wouldn't be here if it had not been for a woman. And none of you would have been either. But that's the reason that, it, that it's there, because of the bloodline. Now, uh, the family of Seth is... is very important, and I want to show you some things. I want you to look uh, in the fifth chapter and the 18th verse. Now it talks about Seth having a lot of kids, but this one kid's important. And the 18th verse, this is one of the children he had. And Jared lived 160 and two years, and he begot Enoch. And Jared lived after, after he begot Enoch 800 years, and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 960 and two years, and he died. And Enoch lived 60 and five years, and he begot Methuselah. Now, who is the oldest man that ever lived on the face of this earth? Methuselah. How long did he live? Methuselah. How much? 969. How much? 
969. I trained you well. <laughs> Oldest man. Now notice, these men that lived all those years, they're still having children. Why? Because God was replenishing the earth. I mean, hey, you're talking about a population explosion. It was a population explosion going on and things were growing. Now, in the 22nd verse, now this is something that's very important. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah 300 years and he begot sons and daughters and all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. First man in the Bible never to die. Now what does Enoch represent to the day of grace? What does he represent to us? Do you know? I want you to underline this in your Bible. Enoch walked with God and God took him. God took him. Starts with an R. R. The rapture. Why did God take Enoch out? The world was going to be destroyed. Now, before the great tribulation, before destruction comes on this earth, what's God going to do with His church? Same thing that happened with Enoch. Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. We walk with God and before the great tribulation period, it says the voice of the shout of the archangel, the trump of God shall sound, and then we that are alive and remain, we shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Along with those that have died in the Lord, we'll go with Him. Amen. That's why tonight, if in this very moment, if God said it's over with, we'd be gone quicker than I could snap my fingers. We'd be gone. And if you're sitting here and you're not saved, you look around and say, hey man, what's happened? But it would be too late for you because you've had your opportunity to come to Christ and to get saved. So this represents the time that, that uh, a rapture. Now, God is getting ready to judge the world. He had given them over to their conscience, whatever they thought that they could do. In the sixth chapter, First verse, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives all that they, had, they choose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. God said, I'm not going to keep fooling around with man. They have done evil. They have married and married and married and gone their own direction. And I'm not going to put up with it. My spirit will not always strive with man. Feel first, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So when man was left just to be guided by his conscience, his conscience led him astray because his mind, his conscience, just continually had evil thoughts. Do you ever have evil thoughts? Oh, not me, Glenn. Don't make me laugh. It might not stay there 24-7, but I promise you it runs through your mind. You ever thought about robbing a bank? <laughs> I have. <laughs> Not recently. <laughs> but it, it has come across my mind. <laughs> I think 
guess the old thing kept me from it. I was afraid I'd rob one that didn't have any money. <laughs> and that, that would sure be rough to go to jail because you robbed a place that didn't have anything. If I was going to go to jail, like it would be if I'd take a big chance to, to do something. <laughs> And so God saw that their imagination was completely, continually evil, sixth verse, and it repented. God said, I'm even sorry, the Lord, that he hath made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And so God said, this is it, boys. I'm fixing to wipe this whole bunch of heathens out. Now, that's our family. They came from Adam and Eve. Murder had been committed. People had grown, population had grown, their imagination, their conscience was continually evil, and God said, I'm sorry that I've ever made them, but I'm fixing to kill that whole bunch that's down there. Eighth verse of the sixth chapter, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why? Because Noah believed in God. Noah had a family. There were seven besides Noah. So now God sets out with his plan. God tells Noah to build an ark. Because I'm fixing to flood this world. For 120 years, Noah preached. He preached every day and said, God's going to flood this world. Tinkity tink tink. God's going to flood this world. Rippity rip rip. Building a boat. I can imagine the people walking by and say, What are you doing, Noah? Building a boat. Why are you building a boat? It's going to rain. What's rain? It had never rained. He said, That's when drops of water is going to fall out of heaven. But come on, let's go out and see that old crazy man out there that's building a boat in the desert. You're going to build a boat, you're going to build it where water is, wouldn't you? So here he is, got a project going. And 120 years he preached and didn't anybody ever come to the altar and get saved. I get all shook up if somebody, if I go a week or two weeks, three weeks and somebody don't get saved. Think I'm not doing my job. Think I'm not preaching the word. I think I'm not letting God have his way in my life. I look back at Noah, man. He just stayed faithful to God even though he didn't have a convert. He kept looking for the rain. But God told him 120 years. And so, man, he preached and he worked. He kept driving nails and cutting boards and taking and putting pitch inside and out, building cages, building rooms, and it was all to God's specifications. I got to see a documentary been several years ago were that they took the Bible, duplicated, built an ark, and they did it computerized and put it on the water. And the way the ark was constructed, there has never been a storm that could have ever flipped it, ever tipped it, or ever caused it to go upside down. Isn't that amazing? The Titanic sunk, but the ark didn't. And it was built by God's specifications. God knew what it was going to take in order to sustain His family and all the creatures from the flood. And so God said He was going to destroy it. He's going to take them uh, all out. Now, the judgment, God told them, this is in the 6th chapter, starting at the 17th verse. Noah built the ark. Now God said, I wanted you to take every animal, bird, creeping things. You can read this when you get home. I would just want to get finished. And I want you to line them up and take them into the ark. How did many went into the ark? All right, you got two Hereford bulls here. How many went into the ark? Huh? Male and female. All right, a male and a female. How many went into the ark? Eight. Two. Fourteen. A dozen. You heard me. 
Now, all our stories, everything that we've learned, it says, and the animals went into the ark two by twos. Am I right? That's all we know, two by twos. That's not right. Of the unclean animals, take them by twos, male and female. Now, what's an unclean animal? Name me one. A pig, a hog. Now, name me a clean animal. Sheep, cow. A cow, all right? Now, just one. <laughs> now, they had to have two qualifications to be qualified as a clean animal. Two things. What is it? Two and a and a hook. Had to have a split hook, cloven hook, and they had to. Chew the cud. Have you ever watched no cow every time she stops? You say, what's she chewing? She chewing the cud. You ever look at her feet? Got a cloven hook. So her feet and her mouth match. Same thing ought to be with us Christians. Our mouth ought to match our feet. We ought to walk. If we're talking it, we ought to walk it, right? So some of us got hoof and mouth disease. <laughs> Not working out too good. You say, where in the world did you get them seven? The 14th. Look in the seventh chapter. And the second verse. Of every clean beast that thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and the female and of the beast, that are not clean by twos, the male and the female, of the fowls also of the air by the seven, the male and the female to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. Now why would God have 14, seven males and seven females to be put on the ark of clean animals? I have sacrifice. If you just had a male and a female, the first time you did a sacrifice, you'd wipe it out. You wouldn't have any, anything else to sacrifice. But if you took 14 with you, if you sacrificed two of them, the other 12 could breed and have more. And so you build your herd so you could keep sacrificing to God. Wasn't no need of taking but a male and a female of unclean animals because they wasn't good for anything except for breeding stock. Now you learned something tonight. Twos and sevens. So God told him, all right, build a boat. He built the boat. God said, I'm going to open the winds of heaven and make it rain. It had never rained. He said, all right, load the animals. Went in by twos. That's 14 still went in by twos. They got inside, it started raining. And it says, who shut the door? God shut the door. He shut it up. Opened the windows of heaven, and it rained, and it rained, and it rained. Now, do you see why he took Enoch out? Destruction was coming. Had all the animals and had eight people. Because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and the grace is undemerited in love of God. God loved him because he walked with him. Flood came. <laughs> How many days did it rain? Forty days and forty nights. How many days with Jesus in the wilderness? Forty days and forty nights. How much did he fast in the wilderness? Uh, Moses was on the backside of the desert. How long? Well, man, that 40 is something to it, isn't it? You just run it all the way through. You find out what 40 means. It'll bless you. Every number, every number in the Bible means something, and it is a blessing to you. So after the rain was over with and started to come down, it said that the boat <laughs> landed, the ark landed on the Mount of Ararat. Shut down there. So after a while, it says that God remembered Noah. It had been raining. Now Noah said, all right, 
I need to know if it's safe to come out. So what did he do? Uh-uh. <clears throat> Send him out a raven. Why? Wanted to see if it quit raining if it had dry ground. Second thing he sent out was a what? Sent a dove out. What happened to the dove? Uh-uh. It came back. Then he laid in a little space and what did he do again? Let the dove out. What did the dove do? When he came back, what did he do? Had an olive branch. He wasn't finished yet. Then what did he do? Send another dove out. And then what happened to that dove? He didn't come back. And God said to Noah, it's safe to go. Noah said, yeah, I've already got the signal. <laughs> no dove, dry land. God said, all right, let the door down. Take the animals out. Now this, what we've talked about now, is the second dispensation. Conscience of man. We've seen the first one. That was innocence. God put them in the Garden of Eden. They stayed there. They had no knowledge of sin, of good and evil. They didn't know any different. They were naked until they took of the forbidden fruit of knowledge of good and evil. God killed the animal, put skins on them, shed the blood, put them out. <coughs> Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now next week will be Christmas program. The week after that, we'll pick up with a third dispensation. Now, I've been able to do one-nighters up this fall. Now, after we go from here, they're going to be kind of spread out. We'll have to do more from that. But, like I said, you'll miss a lot of this. But it, as you read and as we preach along, it'll just it'll become familiar to you. The only way you learn is by repetition. That's it. Repetition. Can you remember the first monkey wrench you ever seen, man? I can. I didn't know how to work. You said, well, I knew right off the bat. I'll guarantee you did it. I saw somebody working. I said, oh, that's how that thing goes. Screw it one way, and it closed. Screw it the other way, and it opened. Saw a pair of pliers that had two little things there. I didn't know why I had two. And I saw an old man that they were closed up where that they got a hold of little stuff and an old man clicked them and he went to that bigger stuff and he could take a bigger pot. I said, oh, that's what that is. He knew how to work it. That's the way the Word of God is. The more you expose to it, the more that it's repeated to you, the more you learn, the more you retain. And that's called growing in grace. Growing in knowledge and growing in wisdom, you begin to take root and grow. And I am so proud of you. You'll never know how proud I am of you that you come and give your time just to study the Word of God. That's important. Hope you've learned something tonight. Hope you take something away that will help you, that will help you to grow. Now, how are you coming along on your memory verses? Don't hold your hand up. <laughs> Are you doing one week? One week. All right. I'm going to give you two weeks. I want you to memorize John 3.16. <laughs> Will that help you? I'm trying my best to get you started. And next, the next time we meet, going to take time and everybody in here is going to stand up and quote no you wouldn't come to I believe you would but get started please get started this is not for me this is for you I want to get your arm over the word of God let's stand